Hello and welcome to the Ritual Misery Podcast, episode beta 856 for Friday the 13th of November 2015. This is a show where two lifelong friends talk about geek stuff and whatever else comes to mind. I'm Amos, and the dude right there laughing at me, which you can see in the little video, is uh, that's Kent. What, what's up, man? Hey, what's going on? You know, one of, one of these days you're going to get that no, shit I, right. No, I did it right once. I don't have once. to do it right anymore. <laughs> Check that box. Man. Nailed okay. it. <laughs> Oh so. my god! All right, yeah. man. How you been? How you been? Uh, busy, like B- super, super duper busy. Yeah, yeah. It yep. Uh, tells me started, nothing. <laughs> yeah, I. Well, I started working for real this week. That was pretty cool. Like actual work. Like actual, yeah. Like going like to meetings actually, and doing emails and shit. Yes, all of that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and it's still not any fun. Like I thought it was gonna. Be. No, it's actually pretty cool because now I'm I'm actually getting to learn and I I like learning so I'm enjoying it so far. Cool, cool, cool. Hey man, um, we actually have a guest this week. Yes, two weeks in a row. In fact, I know. Like we're getting crazy with it here. I know. So we have with us Mr. Chuck Smith from Alamo Bordo. They're in your hometown right now. <laughs> yeah. What's going doing, on, Chuck? Chuck? I'm doing all right. How are you guys? Ugh. I'm yeah, just glad we here. finally got this thing rolling an hour late, you know? <laughs> hour late? Well, well it's on know. time. It's on time for us. Almost. Just because you didn't, Truth. you didn't, no, you didn't do daylight saving. So we are exactly on time. Um, it, is, it is now 10.02 p.m. According to the calendar reminder that we have set up, we are an hour late. I don't want to hear shit because I got out of bed <laughs> with a badass hangover. Bow down to, to the all-powerful calendar. <laughs> right. Oh, my gosh. Uh, so, uh, let's get right on to it, man. Um, Shiro Tora, what the hell? That's a karate tournament. Well, let's hear about <laughs> it. Yeah, um, fucking there's karate a, nerd. Yeah, there's a karate tournament in Alamogordo. I, I I have to interrupt you just for a second. I just called you a karate nerd. There's yep. something about that term that is both delicious and satisfying. <laughs> like a karate nerd that'd be like a a football nerd you know what i mean yeah like you know it just, it, 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 well you, it's funny you that you say that karate can you can i what can you fantasy in karate sure you fantasy I, karate <laughs> i guess so we don't need to get into into his but bedroom well, life all right because yeah, <laughs> you know stephanie's in karate too so you know that can get kind of Anyway, let's move on from that. Yeah, man. Mm-hmm. So, <laughs> so <laughs> anyway, it's funny that you mentioned karate nerd because that's actually a trademark term. There's <clears> a, <throat> I, I think he's like a fifth degree or sixth degree <clears throat> named Jesse Encamp that he trademarked the karate nerd thing. He's got a, a website and a blog and a, all kinds of stuff. Anyway, oh, yeah, uh, yeah. So, 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 so anyway, so Shiratora, <laughs> it actually, that means that's Japanese for white tiger. And it's a karate tournament that we have every year in Alamogordo. It's hosted by my dojo, Complete Martial Arts. And that's tomorrow. So, uh, yeah, I'm going to drink some beer tonight, stay up really late, and get up at 6.30 tomorrow morning to go do get, some karate go stuff. Go get your ass kicked. All right. That's, yeah. That sounds, and that's going to be awesome. kind of an all-day an all day event. So <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be a blast. I can't wait. Yay, scheduled ass kickings. <laughs> <laughs> Well, as Sounds long as you awesome. know it's coming. Yeah, uh, wow. I don't know if that makes it any better. <laughs> how was uh, how was how was your week, Chuck? Uh, it was uh, pretty good. It was uh, short for work. I, I took all. We had uh, Veterans Day on Wednesday, and then I took off the uh, tail end of this week to uh, have a day off and help my wife do some stuff. But for the most part, just a lot of. I actually got a lot more computer time this week than I normally do. I'm usually out running around and talking to people more than anything else. But I actually got to sit down and. Somewhat feel like I accomplished something. I was very proud of myself. <laughs> That's always good. <laughs> yeah, you know, you know, life has gone a little astray when almost accomplishing something is the goal. Right. Like, <laughs> yes. Exactly. Oh yeah. Mission we never want to finish it. Yeah. So. Yeah. Mission started. Wanna... Accomplishment achieved. <laughs> you never want. You never want to finish it because it provides job security. So. Right. Well, right. Yeah. There's yeah. that. Yeah, I, I think we're all a little misled on that one, but I, I'm willing to go with it. <laughs> so uh, so I had a, a very short week as well. We had Wednesday and Friday off. Thursday was a training day, which actually turned out to be a 
good training day for what it was. Wow. And uh, Monday and Tuesday, we're just catching up after the exercise from last week. And uh, really, really quick week, actually. Um, last night, I went and saw uh, Tommy Davidson perform here at the club. Uh, supposed to host for him, but then they kind of nixed that at the last second because his promoter wanted to, wanted to host for him. And I, I guess when you're semi-rich and semi-powerful, you get to say things like that. So instead, I just watched the show and had some drinks and had a good time. And I oh, gotta right say, um, he's he's his birthday was just a couple days ago. He's like fifty two years old, but he is still funny. And the thing that got me was a lot of the skits that he did last night were ones from you know classic days, but with a slightly different take on it or a different version of it, and it was still still pretty pretty damn funny. So I was I was cool with it. I liked it. Right on, right so. on. All right, man. What uh, can't? What's the geekiest thing you did this week, man? <laughs> All right. So, I was cruising Netflix the other night, like I tend to do. I, I, you know, that's the weird thing about Netflix. I, I usually spend way more time just surfing through to see what they have than actually watching things. Yeah. Uh, so I did that for so long that I realized I only had like, I don't know, forty-five minutes or something to actually watch something, and I found something that was thirty minutes long. And I decided to give it a shot. It's called Kung Fury. Uh, okay, okay. Yeah. First, first of all, walk us through this decision process. Now, you, you've you already stated that you had 45 minutes. You have 45 minutes to watch something and then move on with your life. Whatever, right, yeah. whatever you had to do. So you're <laughs> cut down in time. Now, what what made you decide? What Was, was it like the, the, the cover art or was it just the description? Or the name? What was the, the <laughs> had you decide to to go for this particular viewing experience? All right. Well, first of all, it was under the category suggestions for me, so <laughs> it was like four or five down in the list. And I remember Lucas, my son Lucas, had said something uh, in the not too distant past that I should watch this thing, and I was like, yeah, okay, whatever, whatever. And so anyway, so I saw it on my list of suggestions. And I clicked on it, and it was only 30 minutes long or like 32 minutes long or something like that. I was like, eh, okay, uh, maybe. And then I read the description. I was like, okay, this is this has got to be bad. I was like, fuck it. It's 30 minutes. So I clicked on it. It's one of the single greatest decisions I've ever made in my life. <laughs> <laughs> Kung Fury is <clears throat> one of the most amazing things I have ever ever watched it started as a kickstarter apparently uh sometime this year it was so, it's something a, you're already a fan of yeah oh i love kickstarter kickstarter is the shit uh but it so anyway it's a kickstarter film and obviously they got funded and they're on they're on netflix they're on youtube they're on all kinds of stuff and this movie is basically a, a love letter to the 80s like 80s cop movies and holy shit chuck you watched it as well it, twice this, actually this, <laughs> see i couldn't help it i went i watched it i watched it when you when you referred it to me to it and then i had actually i went back this morning uh partly because yes. i didn't talk about it but i went back this morning to look at it again it's, it's it's yeah yeah oh my god it is the most amazing thing this this character is he's basically like like ryu from street fighter 2 that's what he looks like and he's got mm -hmm. this like like uh epic action hero voice and he is he is the greatest cop that ever lived he is an extreme badass he's the chosen one and was able to learn kung fu like instantly i guess and he's the greatest kung fu fighter that ever lived and he's the greatest cop that ever lived and <laughs> A, well, okay, the, so the basic plot is that a villain time traveled from the past into the future, which is modern day, well, which is like, I think, what, 1985? And the villain, his name is Kung Fuhrer, and it's Adolf Hitler. And the reason that he, he didn't actually die in the 40s, he disappeared because he time traveled to 1985. And Kung Fuhrer is like the second greatest Kung Fu artist <laughs> of all time. 
and there's time travel and there's there's laser raptors and thor makes an appearance and it's just so, it is so i have to watch amazing. this yes you have yes it's this mandatory is, this, this yes, i'm watching this immediately after the podcast today yes yes, yes. and your life will be way better for it <laughs> <laughs> It is amazing. One, That's awesome. I know the one scene later in there when when there's a tra- time travel event and Kung Fury goes back to the finally makes it back to the 40s and the fight scene in there. The only thing I kept running through my head was Johnny Cage wins. That's all yes. I heard. Oh my the god! The entire time in my head, just over and over again. It was yeah. It's it was it was it was worth the 30 minutes. Actually, worth the hour because like I said, I watched it twice. So, <laughs> yeah. I basically spent 30 minutes just looking like this, like. <laughs> just smiling. I, it, it was great. It was I got to get a screenshot of that later. <laughs> That's awesome. That is awesome. All right. Um. So the geekiest thing I did all week, uh, I didn't even watch a TED talk. Um. I didn't spend a whole lot of time on YouTube. I mean, I spent a little bit of time on YouTube, which means like five hours. But um, <laughs> I redid our OBS, our broadcasting software to where we actually have um some proper overlays it's not all overly graphic and um got a title screen down i can actually have two or three hosts uh, like i spent probably a good five hours uh on on wednesday redoing all of our broadcasting stuff for our audience so that's right pretty on. much what i did this the, 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 that, that's really the only thing i accomplished this week <laughs> Hey, at least um, you were productive. Yeah, I I did start planning my my trip for my PCS. Uh, three days ago or two days ago was my halfway point in Korea, so started actually sitting down and looking at dates and looking at uh, dates, dollars, and and uh, and uh, dives. You know, um, <laughs> the, the the time we're going to be traveling, uh, how we're going to get there, and how we're going to afford it, and uh, what we're going to be doing along the way. So, um. But yeah, it, it, it's fun. I, I really enjoy planning trips. Um, my problem is that there's just so many unknowns right now that I can't uh, can't can't quite really capture all of it right now. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> but that'll get better. The closer we get there, the better it'll be. And I think we have a pretty solid plan because we're this a it's a very large logistical move because we are uh, we're moving a large distance. And of course, I, I, I'm I'm on the verge of it, but I can't quite say where we're going yet i don't know have i said it on the podcast or not i don't know i don't i don't think you did you um, might have let it slip like 20 episodes ago or something like yeah, that maybe um anyway the, <laughs> it's a it's a very large move and we're taking the travel trailer with us and we have non-military dependents that are moving with us and it's a lot of pieces in the in the in the puzzle so it's gonna be a it's gonna be a fun logistical quest of mine to make that happen so mm-hmm. And then there's always the thing on whether or not Kent's going to travel with me when I take the trailer uh, cross country and stuff. So uh, I have to plan. For, nope. I have to plan for both those scenarios, you know, with or nope. without. So. No, sh- no shenanigans at all on that trip. Oh no, not at all. <laughs> you know, you know the. I think the biggest factor with me is going to be leave because I'm starting from zero leave, um, and yep. trying to build that up now. Yeah, and it's, it's looking like about an eight day trip. Yeah, with the trailer. So I don't know. You can always get to use your loot, use uh, some extra time or whatever else. We can talk about that offline, though. It's yeah, of course. There's, yeah, there's, there's games and ways around it. So anyway, right, yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> so last week we mentioned uh, Darth Jar Jar, <laughs> and <laughs> it, it essentially went like this: we discussed Darth Jar Jar, and we had one of our viewers email in a what, what amounts to a multi-page manifesto on ideas <laughs> about Darth Jar Jar and other theories on Star Wars. So instead of trying to read a multi-page email or trim it down because, well, we're just too lazy, we invited him on the show. So Chuck, <laughs> uh, <laughs> you've got some ideas. I, I have more than, more than a few, unfortunately. Um, but well, first yeah, of all, the, uh, let me say, let me say real quick, I'm a huge Star Wars nerd. I'm a, I'm probably the biggest Star Wars fan that I that I met in my life up to a certain point. Um, yeah, Chuck's got me beat. 
Chuck is a way bigger Star Wars nerd than I am. Mm. So, yeah. So, all right. So, Chuck, what, 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 are, what are your thoughts? Um, well, we wanna, do we want to start with Dr. Jar or we want to go down some of the uh, smaller ones real quick that I sent with it? Uh, let's hit, let's hit Darth Jar Jar because I we, oh, okay uh, the fires are stoked on that <laughs> word so, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, to briefly rehash is that the idea is that that Jar Jar has uh, has been or was always intended to be um, they uh, Darth uh, Sith Lord in the background that is either running co with Palpatine or is actually manipulating Palpatine or, or other events to try to eventually slay him as Sith do. Um, and that there's evidence for this primarily in the, fur, in the, uh, in the Phantom Menace uh, throughout it. Partly in the, the uh, it was um, put out on Reddit, eventually made its own website because it got so much attention and it's floated around circles. Uh, when it first came out, I, I ignored it the first 20 times. Like, it came up on my Facebook uh, timeline because I was like, eh, just, whatever, it's Jar Jar, don't care. <laughs> and then finally it came up like the 21st, the 31st time it came up, I said, okay, I got to read this because it, it kept, it finally came up on a site that I'm fairly familiar with and I found it reputable. So I'll go read through it, read all that, and start going through the examples. And part of it is, uh, for instance, it, it, it references the, uh, after Jar Jar meets Obi Wan and, Qui and Qui Gon in the forest, takes him to Gungan City. He does a rather extravagant somersault into the lagoon and their first thing is that you know that's that's a 20 foot you know jump in which i argue that number but whatever you know it's a 20 foot jump it's a you know flipping jedi type somersault which mirrored some of the some of the ones that obi-wan and quite gonna do later in the movie and you know my first thought the second i saw the gift that they had on it was it's that hard to believe that a big tall lanking alien can jump 20 feet that just seems kind of odd to me. No, and you know, like I said, normally with these kind of things, I don't really pay much mind to them because you know, it's people thinking in theoretics. But I'm like, oh, that's that's simple physics. It's you know, he's taller. He's made for this. This is not the first time he's jumped in this lagoon, obviously, because he can breathe <laughs> air. So he's got to come out some. Come on, guys. <laughs> um, later, later they spend a lot of time during the entire thing. Part of my part of me turning my head a little bit. Um. The uh, uh, talking about how he's using mind control tricks throughout the thing. Uh, one we'll see this referenced is uh, when, uh, as after, uh, or it was before the, the main battle at the end, uh, he's talking to Boss Nass and they're walking next to each other and he's talking. And it's, it's that part where he gets promoted, given a title of general or whatever, and they keep saying, Well, he keeps waving his hand at him. Okay, there's lots of people who wave hands in Star Wars and they're not necessarily controlling <laughs> their mind. You know, it's right. You know, it seems like a lot of the theory behind it was was stretching it. But when you get, but well, what I will give them is this: is when you read through the whole thing, it is it's a structured argument. I don't know if it was meant to be or if it really was meant to be funny to begin with, but it is a rather structured argument, and they do give examples. Now I can refute every one of them, but <laughs> still, nonetheless, it's structured. It's good reading, and it's a good theoretical exercise. My, my, and, and when you get to the end of it, and you know, you, you, there's enough plausible there to sit there and go, okay, all right, I see where you're going with this. But if they turn around to that, I'm, I'm one of the few people that I'll, I'll admit it. I don't mind Jar Jar. I don't care. I don't know why some people <laughs> have such visceral reactions to him, to be honest with you. I can understand why you'd want to have a little, maybe a little bit more serious character or, you know, a little less bumbling. Maybe, you know, I, I've, I've had people that got on him just for his accent. I'm like, R really? But, <laughs> yeah, you know, right. that's fine. Whatever. But at the end of the day, I don't mind him so much. But the thing is, is that if this ends up if this, if somehow in some alternate universe, this ends up being true. And one of these movies, there better be a 20 minute megalomaniacal Palpatine-esque Bond villain monologue on how this works. Because there's no <laughs> way all of this it adds up to, to Jar Jar being some sort of Sith sorcerer that's See, controlling it, the entire universe. Instead of a, a long, a long Bond type uh like a monologue kind of thing what i was thinking about was the end of uh the sixth sense when we figure out <laughs> the, the, the twist ending there it's like what probably 20 second little like flash reel mm -hmm. and that's that's how i had pictured it if this was to actually come to fruition it'd be just like a real quick like oh yeah remember this remember this remember this remember this oh look 
<laughs> there, there is a there is a meme floating around out there that says, "I see Jar Jar." <laughs> I the, the only problem I have with with this theory is the same problem I had with Jar Jar, which isn't his accent or the way he talks or the the attempt at comic relief that he was you know intended for in the in episode one. It's the poor CGI. <laughs> All of this, the hand movements and the limp lip syncing and everything else mm-hmm. that goes along, his spectacular 20-foot jump, all that other mm-hmm. stuff, it, I just put it down to really crappy attempts at CGI. Right. It, well, it, see, I think at, at the time, in 1999, that was pretty good CGI. <laughs> but it looks made, like, it looks like the, shit now. They made the whole good. movie that way, though. <laughs> well, right. Yeah, They're like, hey, it, here's a half-assed technology. Let's do everything we possibly can with it. And right, that, that's, that's the problem I had with the, with the first movie. No, and there were other parts of it that were better. Nobody was saying that. Mm-hmm. No, I was saying it then too. Like <laughs> I, I didn't appreciate the the CGI back then. Well, right, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it was over. <clears throat> it was overdone. There was a lot of there was a lot of critique about like wh- wow, there was way too much CGI and stuff it, like that. The whole but I don't thing think... was CGI except for the desert scene that they shot. You know, <laughs> right. The whole series was CGI except for the desert scenes they shot all at the same time. I thought some of the issue with the CGI and particularly in how much they used is uh, you have Jar Jar, which is really floppy, which there's actually an explanation in the theory about that also. But the, uh, the, they, they did so much of it, like the, like the droidicas and how they unfold, you know, is actually really reminiscent of how they did the Transformers almost a decade later and or actually over a decade later. And it was actually really good. But the problem was it got lost because it, they used so much. And as soon as as soon as they got out of there, they started backing off of it to some degree, or getting a little better about using it. Yeah. And I think that's what some of it, because that, because yeah, that that was something that always kind of bothered me about Jar Jar's character too. I just assumed that it kind of went with a personality type, but uh, well, but yeah, even I mean, the, uh, the the flips that uh, you know Qui Gon and, and mm-hmm. you know all the the uh, fight with Yoda was it the second one episode two yeah. or whatever? Yeah. Oh, in the that, Senate. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like even all that, it was just. <laughs> you know, Yo, I've got extremely mixed feelings about the the Yoda and Dooku fight. Uh, the the way it starts with Yoda walking in with his cane, and then he drops his cane and opens his robe, and, and the whole build up and the musical build up. I and mean, I, you know, I talked a couple episodes ago about how important the music is to Star Wars. That scene will still give me goosebumps right up until they actually start fighting. <laughs> then it get then it kind of gets goofy. I I th- I just think that whole that whole scene would have been better if uh, Yoda had maintained that frailty that that was shown and was still able to, you know, the fight would have still been able to continue the way that it did. But he maintained that that frailty that he would he was showing. I thought it, I, it would have had a lot more character to it, a lot more uh, uh- personality. I think they were trying to show the because they because in some of the books they they talk about how like you can use the force to kind of to kind of, kind of almost like a stem boost where that kind of lets you put away pain um, or you know on the dark side actually use pain and uh, I think they tried to do that without really explaining that you know because that really wasn't out there at the time um, yeah. in many of the books they came back later and kind of explained that and that's that's why I kind of I look at that scene now I, I don't mind it so much I had some of the initial kind of issues with it the same way I. I I'm too much into Star Wars not to just accept it, but you know, still nonetheless, it was it was one of those things that I think they didn't explain. They it spent very too well. much time trying to explain explain how they were going to fuck up the whole universe with midichlorians. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah. That that bit. All right. So but, so what about some of these other uh, these other um, rumors here? Well, let's start with some of the some of the smaller funny ones that I just you kind of I kind of made me look at and go really. Um, there was a rumor out earlier before the summer. Um, May this year, I think, that Daniel Craig, who is uh, currently James Bond, uh, was going to make a cameo as a stormtrooper in uh, in the movie, and along with some other people. Apparently, it got spelled by um, um, Simon Pegg, the Scotty from Star Trek, um, and that he was apparently supposed to do it. Um, he said supposedly that that Craig was going to do it. No, I shouldn't have said that. So on and so forth. And, you know, there's a thing about it in the guardian and that had the telegraph came right back and said, no, he said, he's not doing it. Yada, yada. After I read all of that, I kind of looked at it and went, how would you know? 
they're stormtroopers. The only one I've ever seen take the helmet off is Finn. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. I technically haven't seen that because it's only in the trailer. Yeah. So I'm like, you know, it could it could be Gandhi under that thing. I don't know. It's, it's, who's going to know? That's the point yeah. of it. Yeah. TK TK 007. Heck yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, along with that was a, was a, was a rumor. It was actually from earlier uh, early last year. Um, I've not seen any place where it's really refuted it, um, except for the trailer you tuned me into like literally half an hour ago. Um, <laughs> the uh, is was that Judy Dench was going to play Mom Mothma, and uh, which was actually kind of interesting because I could see her do that. I went and looked, and uh, she's 80. Um, Caroline uh, Blankston, who is the person who played Mom Mothma, uh, is actually 83. So, but her uh, IMDb uh, listing stops in 2006, so she stopped doing movies, whereas Judy Dench is actually in the James Bond movie that came out last week, um, or this week, or whatever week. Um, so she's still acting. So I kind of I looked at it, and I kind of, I was like, okay, I kind of bought that, but uh, there's not, there's no reference to Mom Mothma on IMDb. Of course, there's not one for Luke Skywalker either. So, right. Uh, well, <laughs> on IMDb there is. There's no other reference to Luke Skywalker anywhere. Else, right. So. Not on StarWars.com or anything. No, there's nothing anywhere. I did, I did went and looked that up. That kind of ties into the, to the, the Kylo Ren is Luke Skywalker's rumor, which there's a lot of people running with that. Um, I personally don't buy that for a number of reasons. Um, the, uh, the bigger idea to me, and it's kind of like if you read it in other kind of articles about the movie, is that uh, it seems more like the, the movie's going to be kind of like um, uh, the search for Spock. They're going out there trying to find him. And for whatever reasons, he's exiled himself, which is not too far from from the EU. The EU, the expanded universe, actually has him kind of going off and into self-exile a couple of times. And he goes and locks himself away in one of the Jedi academies and stuff like that. So that's not in of itself not that crazy. But but Ren, Ren is Luke's – I mean, the the, the problem (laughs) with Adam Driver has already been officially named as – see Loren is is it's the problem in of itself he's half the size of mark of mark hamill uh the bite double doesn't work um you know he's you, obviously seen, a lot seen mark there. hamill's fat like i'm saying that, i'm saying you could put you could put you could put uh, mark hamill in obi-wan's robes and you'll know it's mark hamill that's all i'm saying <laughs> I, I thought it was interesting the uh the coincidence that uh mark hamill is the cur- currently the age that sir alec guinness was when he originally played obi-wan so yeah, I yeah. thought that was a, a, a key thing there. And I don't think that's to be overlooked. I think that might actually, I mean, it's, it's sure it may be coincidence, but yeah, I don't, see, I don't, I don't my, like the coincidence. So. My, my whole theory with Luke Skywalker is that this movie is going to follow the pattern of the first movie in the previous two trilogies. So Star Wars or episode four, when it came out, the Jedi master, the, the, you know, the, the wise sage character, was Obi Wan? At by the end of the movie, he was killed by the Sith Lord. So if let's fast forward to the prequel trilogy. The Jedi Master in that movie, the wise sage character, was Qui Gon. By the end of that movie, he was killed by a Sith Lord. Spoiler alert! Holy in this, shit! Yeah, well, in this movie, <laughs> the wise sage character, the Jedi Master, is going to be Luke Skywalker. Stands to reason that, to me that it's going to follow the pattern. He's going to die by the end of the movie, probably by Kylo Ren or some other yeah. Sith or evil character. And there, and that theory is floating out there is that Luke, Luke, they will find Luke, and that he will he will fulfill that Obi Wan type role. If not that ending necessarily happening in this movie, very early in the next. And uh, but there's also theories as to there there everybody see all the theories that are out there seem to agree that some main character is going to die. Mm. And um. I can I can buy that. Not depends how you look at it. Who it is? It could be anybody. I mean, in the EU, Chewie dies. So I mean, right. you know, and there's theories about that that it's going to be him. Um, it's a, there's all theories that it's going to be Chewie's going to die and it's Luke that's going to kill him and so yeah. on and so forth. And it's totally Han. <laughs> <laughs> well, there and, is, and what, what I'm, I'm basing that on a very very simple simple uh, idea. Harrison Ford is in his 80s. Harrison Ford was the last of the original three to sign up for the movies. He was the one that took the longest to convince, and he's the one that was that has the star power 
to most likely have the story reflect his personal views on it. Well, he wanted his he wanted his character to die in the Empire. Or I'm sorry, in Return of the Jedi. Right. Originally. Right. Mm-hmm. So I think he's going to come in. He's going to fulfill that that strong uh, masculine role on the hero side to start with. I think um, at some time during the movie, his character will die. Han Solo will die. Maybe with or without Chewie. I don't know. And before the end of the movie, they will find or otherwise locate or know the, know the location of um, Luke Skywalker. I don't mm. think he will start the movie in it. And I think that's where it, it really gets interesting because it's one of those things where, okay, we have R2 and R2 is floating around with, you know, Princess Leia or, or whatever else or, or whatever she, her new title is or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, floating around with Leia, but R2 knows where Luke is. And well, I think yeah, that, yeah, if they follow the theory of the of the EU, R2 never got wiped. So if they borrow that from EU, then yeah, he would absolutely know where he is. Right. Yeah, R2 is the only character that knows everything. Yeah. <laughs> but but he's he's been told, you know, been instructed. I, I'm going to say instructed. That could be verbal or programmatically. Or pro- programmatically, he would, program, he would have programmed um, himself. Yeah, one, one way or the other, he's been instructed to not give away that information to anyone until a certain circumstance happens. And I think maybe that that circumstance will be Han's death. Hmm, I could kind of buy that. Okay, so that's my yeah. personal theory. That's I haven't read that anywhere. That's just putting the pieces together and hearing the conversations from the people that I listen to on the podcast and you know things like that. That's what's well, it's going to be interesting in about a <clears throat> wow, about a month and a week from now to go back and listen to this episode and and just yeah. laugh about how ridiculous we sound. Mm. And, and while we're talking about while we're talking about theories, I'd love to throw one out of my own that this probably has no shot in hell, but still, nonetheless, I think would be interesting is the fact that you know everybody's talking about you know like so started this one with Ren is, is is Luke. The thing was, I went back, I thought about, it, and there's you know gone through the reasons as to why not. But the other thing is that when you, when you listen to the trailer, Ren's talking to Vader's mask, you know, I will finish what we started, so on and so forth. The thing is that that, that suggests some sort of intimate knowledge of Vader, which at, and so far as the movies are concerned, really is only Palpatine and Luke. Um, you know, Leia doesn't know him as who he actually is and so on and so forth. And so it kind of got me, it's like, well, who else do I know from, you know, again, EU, and, and all you people that are going to sit there and talk about, that's not canon, stop it. The, <laughs> um, yes. the thing is that you, then, uh, in the Force Unleashed games and the subsequent books, uh, Stalkiller is a clone that, well, was, a, was a, the first game, he's an actual person, and the second game, he's a clone. And at the, uh, at the end of Force Unleashed 2, if you could choose Dark Side Ending, uh, he's killed by another apprentice that Vader just has. It's a dark apprentice who is another another clone of Star Killer, and he sends him out at the end and goes into the downloadable content for Endor, where he goes out <laughs> hunting down Jedi. So you know, and he sends him to the outer reaches, which is you read any Star Wars books can take you years just to get to, much less go around trying to find rogue Jedi and come back. So you know. Just saying. Mm. Nice. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. You never know. <clears throat> now there is there is one theory that I can't really reconcile, and it's just because I don't know enough about it. What? And that is, I, I ran I ran into one. I haven't had a chance to research. Is really what I mean. Uh, is one. There's one that revolves screenshot of Finn carrying what looks like an awfully familiar looking lightsaber. The hill is supposedly the one from Luke. Supposedly Luke's from the Empire Strikes Back. Now, as we know. Look, it's hand cut off, hand, lightsaber, disappear into the abyss, wherever it goes. Theoretically, it would have come out an exhaust port like he did um, after, after the battle was over. So the question, the, 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 the question that gets postulated with this theory is that somehow it's floated off into space. <laughs> yeah, and that makes sense. And fallen on uh, Jakku, uh, which is the, one of the planets in, uh, in, in supposedly in, in the Force, uh, Force Awakens. And that that is their trigger or what they're trying to use or, or something. They're trying to get it back to Luke Skywalker. Now, the thing is, is that in a few shots that we see of Finn with a lightsaber, it's the right color. It's the right shape. 
it's the right size. It doesn't really show a good enough view of it to see every single gnarl that's in it. So, you know, people like me who, yes, I have screenshots of all the lightsabers, <laughs> um, uh, can compare it. But there, there is that. They're saying that that's probably what is happening. They're trying to get it back to Luke, which, you know, which would lead, lead to the theory that one of the two new main characters is force sensitive and would end up using it. Again, theoretically, it would be Finn since he's the one we see in the snapshot. Or maybe that's, maybe that's where Luke's been this whole time, is out looking for his own lightsaber. <laughs> it could be. Now, Bespin's a gas giant, so if it falls normal, <laughs> it won't go back on. Um, well, let's, the, remember, uh, let's remember this is actually Anakin's lightsaber. Right. And it, it does was, point that out in the theory. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Yep. And that's, what, and that's why they're saying they would do that, is because it would tie all three sets of trilogies together. Ah, I see. And I could, I could, I could see Disney doing that easy. That's not. It's just this matter of explaining how they got a hold of it when you know normal gravitary, gra uh, planetary gravity tells me that in a gas giant it's going to the core and getting crushed. But, yeah, well, it could, it could no, have been an Ugnot. An Ugnot, an Ugnot retrieved it and <laughs> sold it to some space merchant or something, and then. Well, there's no <laughs> evidence that it actually fell out of the fell out of the Cloud City, so it may just right. be sitting at the bottom down there, you know. Needing, needing some needing some love. Who knows? It might be a little rusty, but it's down there, you know? Yeah, well, maybe, sitting, there with a, sitting there with a decomposing bloody hand. It's got to be rusted by now. Yeah, so, uh, well, maybe Lando's had it this whole time. Oh, there's, yeah, there's, see, there you go. Now let him <laughs> explain that one. <laughs> what, are the chances, um, what are the chances we see Lando uh, make a, an appearance in this series? I think well, it's that would be – yeah, that would be awesome because – I. I Okay, Star Wars itself is known for keeping secrets from you know, from the audience until the, the actual reveal. And J.J. Abrams himself is known for this. In fact, in, in the second Star Trek movie that he directed, he flat out lied to the audience by saying that because there was a theory going around that Khan was going to be the villain – in the second Star Trek movie, and he's like, no, 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 we're not, we're not reusing that character. Khan's not in this, whatever. Well, obviously, it turned out to be Khan. So, but it was a different Khan. Well, right, right. but it's basically the same character. So, but if you're going to be JJ splitting Abrams, hairs, that's a, that's a, that's a good hair to split. <laughs> it's a completely sure, different but, reality. So, yeah. but the whole thing with with not showing Luke Skywalker and any of the press material, um, he. He's got a, a voiceover in one of the trailers, and we think we might see his hand in it's one a, of the it's scenes a or whatever. Voice under, but yeah, or well, whatever. <laughs> uh, Splitting uh, hair, but, but it, it's getting us all talking about like, well, where's Luke? Is he dead? Is he is he a Sith now? Is he you know what's going on there? Well, that could totally be a swerve. I can see this completely being a swerve from J.J. Abrams and from from the Star Wars franchise altogether that maybe he's in 90% of the movie and yeah. he's just a, a good right. Jedi and this and is they've all shown us every out. shot that he's not in. <laughs> exactly. <Yeah. laughs> How pissed off would you be if like all this theory about where Luke Skywalker is and he's actually in the opening scene right. s sitting yes. there in a chair showed, like never even gets up, doesn't get up, doesn't use a lightsaber, no force powers or anything else just sitting in the chair like he's in a chair in every scene in the background just chilling out <laughs> like a, like a little easter egg waiting to happen on even in the trailers we just haven't seen it yet you know like <laughs> he's got a faded picture behind the the word crawl at the very beginning yeah just right sitting, sitting in the background <laughs> yeah every time there's an a he's actually the uh this the blank space in the a is actually a really small picture of him <laughs> in a <the> chair <laughs> or he's just in the background doing the ymca <laughs> So making, so, so making up letters. It's right. a T. <laughs> <laughs> so, to bring, so to bring this all back around to Lando Carissian, you know, we've received no indication thus far that Lando is in it, that Billy D. Williams is not in the credits at all. Maybe he is there. Maybe maybe he is going to be in the movie, and it's just being kept from us. Yeah. Because well, know. Billy, Billy D. Williams did play Lando in the, the current uh, animated series, Rebels. Mm-hmm. So, so he's, you never he know. does still have some involvement there. That's pretty right. Awesome. Absolutely, yeah. There's right. a lot of instances in, uh, again, in in EU, well, even in the books after Disney took over. There's a lot of instances where uh, Lando is used in the middle of books, um, kind of like he is in the movies. He doesn't show up until the second movie. 
Right. Um, he's used as that intermediary, like, okay, we're in a tough spot. We need somebody with CD contacts and doesn't mind doing dirty work and so on and so forth. And then all of a sudden, there's Lando. Right. And he's, uh, he's, he's one of those people that tends to find himself in the middle of things because of people he's known in his development of his various sundry businesses. And, mm-hmm. you know, ends up getting put in a tough spot because of it. So it would not surprise me at all if they turned around and did that again this time, especially if they were to, you know, if they were to kill off Han. And I mean, to, to fulfill that older smuggler role, we, that's the only person you really have left. Right. Unless, you, unless you're going to bring in a Dash Rendar or something, which, you know, right. yeah, good luck with that. <laughs> all yeah, right. So yeah. uh, I think we should uh, we should just wrap it up by watching this, uh, this little trailer here. Um, it's an it's a honest trailer. Uh <laughs> <laughs> by the um the screen junkies and uh we're gonna do this partially just to try out this right here click on here and there it is so people watching should be able to see the screen um and, uh, and we're gonna give you a little treat of a korean commercial while we're at it this is yes. a- <laughs> <laughs> so here here we go <laughs> Puppets kissing. In a beer commercial. Never, never not fun. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> it's actually really disturbing. Oh, Santa Cruz! Wow, he got a <laughs> he got a beer goatee. <laughs> oh jeez. He, 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 he might need to cut down on the beer a little bit. <laughs> this is a, a, an extremely long commercial. All of them are here. Like there are no short commercials for YouTube. Oh, oh, like, oh, that, that would drive me insane. Yeah. This would drive me to get mix. YouTube Red. <laughs> <laughs> okay, here, here's the actual video. Hey, is that Leia? It kind of looks like her from Return of the Jedi. I don't know. Is that the Crash Star Destroyer from the first teaser? Will you guys stop? I'm trying to watch the trailer. Who are you? Depends who you ask. There's a lot of fan theories floating around, but you can backorder a tiny version of my droid for 150 bucks. Nothing will stand in our way. We will fix what you started. I don't like sand. It's coarse, rough, and irritating. It gets out. <laughs> There were stories about what happened. Yippee! It's true. All of it. Midichlorians. Without the midichlorians, life could not exist. Jar Jar. Misa Kotia Jar Pinks! The special editions. They're real. But forget all that. Some new nerds directing now. And this looks awesome. Hey, remember those things? TIE fighters are still cool, right? Who's that guy? He looks bad. I bet it's giving you goosebumps right about now. We could show you two hours of a monkey washing a cat, and you'd still go see this movie. Twice. The prequels. They're gnawing at you. Just let them go. It's on you, Abram. Where's Luke? Did he turn on the dark side or something? Why no. is he in the trailer? What do you want him to do? Give away the whole movie? Hey guys, don't it's forget fantastic. the trailers for the Phantom Menace also were kind of cool. Don't ruin this for me. <laughs> oh man. So so there's that. And yeah, that pretty much sums up our entire conversation up to this point. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. All right. So today is Friday the 13th, man. 
Sure is. Oh, what a day. What a day. Uh, yeah. So speaking of Friday the 13th and uh, referencing back to mm. Kickstarter, like we started the conversation about. Somebody came up with an idea for a Friday the 13th game and Kickstarter would be the best place to find funding for it. Well, they were able to get the the uh, current license holder, which is the director of the original Friday the 13th movie, uh, a whole bunch of actors that were in the movies, uh, voice talent, all kinds of, of uh, video game uh, programmers and, and talent in that realm. Um, there, the uh, person that did the original score for Friday the 13th is involved. They, they gathered all of this, this Friday the 13th talent, and they came up with an idea for a video game that celebrates the series. And basically what the game is, it's a 1v7 multiplayer game where one person is Jason and the other six players are camp counselors. Jason's goal, obviously, is to kill all of the counselors. And the, or I said six counselors, it's seven counselors. Yeah, it's one V seven. Because why well, the, Right. Yeah. So, the, <laughs> so the, all of the other seven characters, their only goal is to survive the night. They can either work together. They can work separately. They can do, you know, it's, it's pretty much an open together. world, right? It's, it's, it's at camp crystal Lake. It is basically an open world environment and they can do, you know, they, they can try to escape from uh, the camp, they can try to get the cops there. They can try to kill Jason. They can just try to hide for the entire time. It looks absolutely amazing. It's on Kickstarter, and it's either ending in the next fifteen minutes, or it's it ended like forty five minutes ago. Uh, but but the the Kickstarter, yeah, of course. The, yeah, exactly. The the <laughs> Kickstarter ends on Friday the thirteenth, which I I thought was just a a brilliant touch, and I was hoping when I when I was preparing for the show notes and everything, and I I realized that it was Friday the thirteenth. I was like, oh, perfect! I'll I'll highlight the Friday the thirteenth Kickstarter and try to promote it. Well, by the time this show airs, it's either over or it's about to be over, and they've already met their goal anyway. So the only thing that you could do really at that point is get your your uh, donor rewards or, you know, try to push them over the top for uh, yeah, uh, it's, a stretch. Uh, it, goals. It's showing successfully raised $823,704 with 12,218 backers. Yeah. Yeah. So it was pretty popular. It was, it was, you know, easily fun, got funded. Um, so, yeah, so that was, that was pretty cool. Uh, speaking of, of Kickstarters, though, the popular one right now is Mystery Science Theater 3000, MST3K, is making a comeback. And it is Kickstarter funded. Bring back Mystery Science by Joel Hodgson. Yep. yep. Nice. And it's so, yeah. only... How's that? It's actually got a, the original TV uh, role. 15,000 backers, $1.6 million out of $2 million goal with 28 yep. days left. That's going to get yeah. started. Yeah. Oh, yeah, totally. It's only been live. For New like season it. of up to 12 feature length movie riffing episodes. Yeah. That's going to be fantastic. Yeah, that's going to be great. That's <laughs> They're going to they're, they're make that goal, bring it back, but I still don't have season two of Firefly. I'm a little, little upset. <laughs> yes. I, I think if we can just convince Joss Whedon to just – Go ahead and fucking do it. I think everyone else will be on board. I, they could even kickstart it. Whedon. I think it's Fox. It's Fox. I think it's Josh Fox. Whedon. It, Josh Whedon and all the characters said they would come back and do it if yep. somebody would buy the rights from Fox. Yep, but Fox has, has got a grip on the rights, like uh, like but for another not gonna, ten, fifteen years, I think. If they're not going to fucking do anything with it, which they're obviously not, they need to sell the rights. They, sell it. Sell it to Joss, and he can fund it with either Kickstarter or Indiegogo, or uh, GoFundMe or any of that door to door campaign. Get, picking up pennies. I don't care. Make that shit happen. <laughs> he, whatever price Fox gives, we will raise that money in probably about twenty four hours. Yeah, Fox. It, it Fox would be keeps a, a license. Yeah, well, Fox keeps the license because they make a lot of money off the merchandising right now, and in that, I think a lot is part of the problem. Well, yeah. as, you know. as we heard uh, a couple months ago from Margaret Weiss, I mean, they 
they have the license to create the the game and things like that. It's just a matter of the television rights and the movie rights, things like that. Right. Fox just isn't letting right. go. Right. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah. It's you know, our own fandom is our demise. Yeah. We're we're our own demise when it comes to this because we keep buying Firefly shit. Yep. Yep. <laughs> and they don't even need to sell yeah. the rights. They just need to license it out to them for you know whatever for for a sh- a, another series or right whatever you know. They yeah. they can keep they can keep fifty percent of any profits and everybody is gonna get rich out of the deal. Yep. And we and so. we get our damn TV show like. Give us what exactly. we want. I don't even watch TV. I would fucking die for that. So, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> great. <laughs> That'd be that great. Shit, put that shit on Netflix only. Let us fucking sit there and binge watch it day one. Oh jeez. Yeah. And then binge Fuck watch the it on day two. Yeah, uh, we we were talking about the the Firefly game. You know, I I picked up that RPG and I have yet to finish finish reading the rules so I can host a game. I promised Chuck probably two or three months ago that I was going to do that. I promised Lucas months ago that we were going to do that and it it still hasn't happened and i just realized that it's buried under some paperwork that i have sitting over here in the corner so i'm gonna have to break that out but uh like speaking your, of your office is buried in paperwork right now that's that is true that is true this is <laughs> this is the messiest room in the house right now it's pretty bad uh but chuck speaking of of tabletop gaming uh we've kind of got a little uh tabletop gaming thing going on even though it's only happened once so far, uh, hey, actually, many- we actually had one. That's that's bar- better than I thought. We were right, going exactly. To the year. Exactly. We got it <laughs> off the ground. But, uh, so you you wanted to you wanted to say a few words about tabletop gaming? I think just briefly, uh, like you know, there's been a, a resurgence of late in the last couple of years of tabletop gaming. I, I actually think that's really good. And one of the reasons is uh, actually my own daughter. I, I tell anybody will sit for five minutes and, and listen uh, a story about my daughter. We she got interested in board games. She sees me playing. I've played board games for years, board games, card games. I still have old Decipher Star Wars game cards that you can barely find anymore. I still yeah. look for people to play them. Uh, because the thing was, like when I was younger, it was it was fun because we like with the with the Star Wars game, we, you go places, you play games with people, you meet new people, you you interact with them, you have to deal with them because they're sitting right there. That's one of the one of the reasons why like you know Magic's really big and and some but the tabletop gaming is starting to get to that point again where you actually go to people's houses and have game nights and it's good um, for that social interaction. That's better. I mean, if you um, I know a, a friend of mine back home that does them now and and just like you know you used to you put the you go to a party, you put the keys in the bowl. He takes her cell phones and puts them in the other room, and oh, they're nice. forced to sit there and play. Unless there's an app, unless there's like a like a scorekeeping app that's required, and he goes gets his note and brings it in and uses that. And uh, because I think it's, it's it's starting to get to a point where like w- with this kind of technology where we're skyping over, you know, you're in another country, and so on. So that's great and everything. But the thing is, we we're so buried in into our technology and stuff. It's good to every once in a while sit down and do something different. Mm-hmm. Um, right. But with my daughter, she saw us playing, saw me start collecting games again um, and playing them with, I've gotten Mariana into a couple of them because we found some of their kind of resource-based up her alley. Uh, Catan's one of them. Um, but we went and got her a princess version of, uh, a prince, uh, Disney princesses version because, you know, Disney, between Star Wars and Disney princesses, they, they just have my hooks in me. I can't get out of it. <laughs> um, they, uh, uh, of, of Candyland. And if you don't know how Candyland works, basically, you know, the, the adults get two cards. You pick one, and you move, and you move forward to whatever the next color space is. Well, in this one, there's special pace, uh, spaces that are aligned with the different Disney princesses, and you pick it and you go to it. The adults, you pick it. If it's behind you or you, you get it, you get, it's behind you, you go backwards on the game, which is bad. Um, so once, But for the little kids, you pick, you pick one, and they go forward, and if they pick one that makes them go back, you just ignore it and give them another one. Well, one day I was sitting down with with Elise, who was she's five now, she was four then, and she we were playing. I said, you know, let's let's try this, let's see what happens. So I gave her two cards, and she had a choice: a, a regular one and then one with a princess on it. But it was behind her, and she wants the princess one because it's a Disney princess. Why wouldn't she? And I said, well, if you take this one, you're going to go back. She's like, well, I, don't, I want the princess. Okay, here you go. And I moved her back on the board, and she stopped. She looked at it. It's like okay. Came back two, three days later, played it again. I gave her were the choice is actually ironically the exact same choice and she has ever since then not taken the princess behind her and that got me to sit and think that's something that we don't teach kids on that level anymore because that's a that's that's the start of critical thinking 
That's a starter sitting there going, taking a situation and going, this is bad for me. This is good for me. Even though I really like this, this is better for me. I need to make this choice. And I'm actually kind of glad that with this board game, re- uh, this board game resurgence, that, the, that the, some of the games that we used to play are starting to slide age groups back a little bit to get these kids to play games and make them critical, critically think. Elise, that's my daughter, she, she kills us at life. She plays life with Mariana because <laughs> Mariana loves life. She kills us. She absolutely destroys me every time we play. Um, and she start, she went over. We were playing Munchkin that one time when we when we did have a, a card game. And she, I had them out the other day. Every once in a while, I'll try to play games solitaire just to rem- remember how to play the rules. And she came in, and she wants to play. And she actually picked the cards up. She's starting to read now. And she picked the cards up and said, well, Daddy, this one goes with that one. And I'm like, sure enough, it did. It was a warrior, and things said warrior only. And I'm like, well, all right, cool. So she's starting to make decisions based off of that. And I think that's good. If for no other reason, if you can get your whole family to sit down together and do something that doesn't involve watching it, even if you have the TV on in the background, just do something together that uh, is, is good for everybody, especially if it starts in with critical thinking like that. And it's just mm-hmm. something that's kind of close to me, just having grown up with games and everything like that. But to actually see that in my daughter and have that trigger to me is just something that's very important. I always I preach that to everybody I can. Hey, get your son or daughter a game. It doesn't matter what it is. Something It could be something you're interested in. It doesn't matter. If you're interested in it, I promise you they will be interested in it. If only for a year or two, but if you get them to start thinking like that, then that's what's... Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we, well, uh, put. well put. We've actually had game night at our, our place, you know, back when I was at home um, <laughs> several times, and it's always a no cell phone, no computer, no distraction kind of time, and uh, it really enhances things. Now the twins will get itchy, like we'll play Monopoly, and the twins will get itchy and just start making wrong decisions on purpose. They can go check their phones. Um, <laughs> but, uh, it always yeah. comes down to no matter who's playing, it's everybody against me because I have this knack of winning Monopoly. But, <laughs> but, uh, but Monopoly I'm, is a family destroyer. It's you it's, are uh, you are the Donald, but, you are Donald Trump. I, well, that's just it. I play the game straight up. Like I I don't play any crazy rules. I don't try to convince people of maniacal things or anything else i'm very upfront and very straightforward and i think that throws everybody off when i play because <laughs> they're like what are you getting out of this I, I, I get this property i like i like indiana avenue I, I don't understand the problem is you know but you don't have the other ones right i like indiana avenue you know <laughs> right yeah if, no, if nothing else i'm blocking someone else from having them out. there you go um right. that, that's a lot that, that's it a lot of times but, uh, but yeah, I, I really enjoy playing board games, especially with the kids. I tried to get in, into Munchkin um, once, but they were only halfway into it, so we never really actually played. I did play with my daughters, uh, and uh, with Amber and Ashley, and my ex-wife at one time. And uh, that went over like a bag of rocks. So um, Amber and Ashley loved it, uh, not so much for the ex-wife. So one more reason I like that game. And, um, <laughs> you know, it, it is what it is, right? Oh, uh, what else would it be? Um, but yeah, that's, so I, I agree. I agree completely. Yeah, absolutely. I, you know, board games are great. And we used to, the, the four of us, we used to have kind of a, a set board game night. I, I think it was Saturday night. And uh, we kind of got away from that. And I always enjoy it when when all four of us are in the mood to play a game because it's so often that one of us or two of us or maybe three of us are in the mood to play a game but all four of us to be in the same mood at the same time to play a game it's it's not as often as as i wish it was yeah and because it it almost always turns into a a really good time when we just say you know what screw it i'm gonna drop what it whatever it was i was i was gonna be doing sit down and play the game it almost always ends up being a really great time. Yep. So yeah. All right, Chuck. Uh, where uh, where can people find more about you if they want to? They say, you know what, that Chuck Smith guy, man, he's he's right up my fucking alley. I want to want to you know find out what, how he picks his nose in the morning. Yeah, uh, I want to stalk this guy. Yeah. <laughs> where should they start? Yeah. They, I, I I wish I could tell them they could wait in line. Um, I don't. <laughs> I'm not. I, this my is main the man who needs his boogers picked. That's what. That's, <laughs> that's what I'm getting. Hey, you know what? I have I have very few needs. If I can find one person to fill each of them for a reasonable price, I mean, you know, that's that's my business. Um, no, I, 
I'm not. Uh, I'm actually. My main presence is actually on Facebook, but I, I had a Twitter at one time. But I realized I don't say anything. So uh, I've since shut it down. Though I'm, I'm, I'm probably gonna turn it back up one of these days. But so I have. Is, I actually. You have it like me, where your Facebook automatically ports over to your Twitter, and your Twitter automatically ports over to your Facebook. So whenever you post to one, it posts to both. Because I don't like differentiating between the two. I just go over whatever the whatever has more bubbles on it. Boop. Okay, right. that's what I'm looking at. Today. <laughs> you know. <laughs> so, mm-hmm. all right, man. Uh, Kent, how about you, man? Well, of course, you can find me on Twitter at rm underscore del noche. Um, yeah, right. Yes, <laughs> uh, underscores. Fuck underscores. What's the internet. <laughs> yeah, one of these days I'll get a better Twitter handle. Uh, you can also go to ratebeer.com, look up username Del Noche. I've actually got a few rates in there over the past week, one of which is this fine beverage from New Belgium called Pump Kick. And in case you couldn't guess, it's a pumpkin ale. And I made a joke after I submitted my review for this one because this was the second pumpkin ale that I rated in the same night. And I gave the first one that I reviewed a, a you know fairly good review. And then I rated this one. And it was so much better than the first one. And <laughs> I thought of a joke, you know, always after you hit submit, you think of the good joke. I was going to say, you know, hey, call, you know, calling out the, the first beer that I rated, New Belgium just pump kicked your ass. But <laughs> it was too late. I already hit submit. Uh, so anyway, check out my reviews on ratebeer.com. Username Del Noche. What about right. you, Amos? At Ethan Kane. Since 2008, baby. I've had actually three... <laughs> Three people have requested me give up that that because it's their actual names as opposed to <laughs> some random shit I used in high school. Um, nope. But no, I I, I keep it. Uh, it's it's I'm mostly I keep it because I can't use my real name because that was already taken before I chose Ethan Kane. So um, <laughs> apparently, 2008 was too late for Twitter. Uh, <laughs> you can't be used. Nobody can. I know, right? <laughs> right. Um, <laughs> So yeah, uh, you can you can find it there. Uh, find me there. You can find me on Facebook if you really want to, which I don't know why you'd want to. All my all the same shits on on Twitter as I just explained. So <laughs> yeah, but check out the show. Check out Ritual Misery podcast. Well, on, that you can that, do. Yeah, is that is that the the Facebook page? Is that is that the name Ritual Misery podcast? Um, I believe so. Yes. Yeah. Just well, up, I know if you search just, it, if you search it, just, it yeah. If you do the search for Ritual Misery, uh, as soon as you get past all the really yeah, shitty it's music, podcast. it's us. Like all of them are us. <laughs> So just look for a Ritual Misery. Um, <clears throat> you can follow the show at Ritual Misery. Uh, submit ideas on our subreddit, ritualmisery.reddit.com. You can email us, podcast at ritualmisery.com. You can call and leave us voicemail, 567-69-TRMPC. That's 567-698-7672. Um, you can find all these links and more at our support page, uh, ritualmisery.com forward slash support, or I think it's forward slash support. Ritual Misery. Just go to Ritual. Yeah, yeah, just go to exactly. RitualMisery.com. <laughs> um, thank you so much to Kevin Cloud for allowing us to use your music. And thank you for listening and watching. For Kent, for me, and for you, this has been your Ritual Misery Podcast. See ya. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>